The Week in Doubt, episode 290. Hey everyone. Wow, so I just got in from work probably about an hour or so ago. Absolutely miserable work week. So this might really be a bad time or a bad uh, headspace to be in to be talking about what we're going to talk about. Originally, I was going to talk about some guy named Mark Taylor, a.k.a. the Firefighter Prophet, who makes all these kinds of uh, nutty predictions. Uh, As you might imagine, um, far-right, Christian, conservative type. And I may have covered him on the show before, I'm not sure. But recently, over the, uh, the past weekend... I guess he was on a podcast, and he said something about how Trump's enemies are going to use some kind of secret hurricane-creating technology uh, when the next midterms come around. And maybe I'll read just the first little paragraph, but I won't spend too much time on it. And so this was from Right Wing Watch. Mark Taylor, the so-called firefighter prophet about whom Liberty University is making a movie, appeared on Sheila Zelinsky's podcast over the weekend, where he warned that those who oppose President Trump will use secret technology to create hurricanes just before the midterm elections in order to suppress voter turnout among Trump supporters. Yeah, so batshit crazy. There really isn't much more we need to say about it. Uh, The sad thing is that there probably are people out there who uh, believe this guy's garbage. But I might as well move on to what I really wanted to talk about. So, I woke up this morning. um, Sounds like the beginning of a blues song. It was around uh, 8 a.m. And I hear that distinctive noise of the... uh, the messenger app going off on my iPhone. And it was uh, one of my bandmates, who's also one of my best friends, and uh, really big Anthony Bourdain fan, and so am I. And we used to talk about Bourdain all the time. And he, it, it might sound kind of cold the way he worded it, but once again, uh, he and I are both were r- really big fans. He said, have you heard that Bourdain offed himself? And this was at like, once again, eight in the morning. I'm like, what? You know, I'm still trying to wake up. So I quickly Googled it and I saw it was, you know, on the front page of the uh, Huffington Post and all the other news outlets. And of course, this comes on the heels of the uh, the suicide. Uh, it's my chihuahua going ape shit of my... Uh, the suicide of my chihuahua, no, the suicide of Kate Spade, uh, this um, really successful designer. And I remember that grabbed my attention too. She had, uh, I think it might have been back on the 5th, today's the 8th as I record this, that um, her her body was discovered. She had uh, committed suicide apparently. Yeah, I just wanted to double check. Yeah, indeed it was uh, June 5th. And uh, I guess it was ruled a suicide by hanging. And um, Bourdain had apparently also hanged himself. And I have to admit, I never really knew much about Kate Spade, but the news of her suicide still grabbed my attention. Uh, Because for a while, I was kind of an Apple junkie. I remember when I went back to school for design, we learned on Macs. So I really kind of, I took to Macs. And uh, around that same time, I think I got my first iPod. So I really became kind of locked into the, you know, the Apple ecosystem. And I can remember years back shopping around for like an iPhone or an iPad case and seeing on Apple's official website these, you know, special Kate Spade designs. And... um I think, to me, it seemed like the designs were more geared towards um, female consumers, perhaps. But still, having a design background, I remember thinking, I'm like, hmm, those are still cool-looking designs, though. And I also remember how pricey the, uh, the cases were. And so I had remembered Kate Spade because of that. And um, I had seen her designs here and there, and and I kind of, you know, admired her work. And because she was so successful, I I had heard her name repeatedly. So it definitely grabbed my attention when, on the news, I heard that she had 
committed suicide. And there was a really strange development that I think maybe broke today, and I'll include a, an image in the YouTube version of this episode, that her husband supposedly surfaced. He was caught, you know, leaving his home or elsewhere, and he was wearing, like, a cartoon mouse mask and kind of casually carrying a, a, a mug of coffee in one hand. Very, you know, very, very odd. Um, who knows what that's about? Maybe he's trying to make a point about wanting privacy, or maybe he's not exactly in his right mind uh, in the wake of his spouse's suicide, you know? But uh, I guess as it turns out, she had been battling mental illness or, you know, kind of mood disorders for quite some time. I think specifically she had been wrestling with uh, depression and anxiety. And I'm always hesitant to label things like anxiety or depression as forms of mental illness, probably because I myself wrestle or have wrestled with those things. So uh, I don't want to think of myself as being mentally ill. You know, I'd rather, for some reason, a mood disorder sounds subtler or something. Um, yeah, but supposedly she had a long history of wrestling with those figurative demons. And I guess still her suicide seemed uh, to catch those around her by surprise because I guess she was actively, you know, trying to help herself. She was taking steps to, uh, to get or step up her treatment or whatever. And one of the first things I thought of when I heard this story was that it was another example of how it seems that no matter how much you achieve in life, no matter what heights of financial or social success you attain, that doesn't mean that you're automatically going to be free from your demons. People just seem to carry their uh, their baggage along with them, you know? And I think uh, a lot of people, including myself, I have to admit, we have this kind of idea that if the circumstances of our lives were just better, if we were making more money, maybe if our living situation was better, maybe if our romantic situation was better, um, maybe if we had a better, more fulfilling career or whatever, that the lion's share of our problems would go away or we'd be that much happier. And to some extent, that might be true. I, I think that not having to worry as much about bills or putting food on the table or, you know, not having to live paycheck to paycheck or something like that. I'm sure that does take a lot of stress off your shoulders. But still, you know, I think if you don't face your demons, I'm not saying that she didn't. But what I'm saying is if you're a person who does struggle with these kind of issues, to some degree, I don't think it matters how much success you attain or how good your life might appear on paper or on the outside to others, um, the, you know, those ghosts, that baggage can still catch up with you and, and threaten to swallow you whole, you know? And I think in some way, maybe that can kind of be a positive reminder to those of us who may be <laughs> far from that level of success or whatever, or notoriety, that, or financial stability, whatever, that success isn't necessarily the answer or some cure-all or antidote to wrestling with things like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, uh, whatever it is, poor body image or something like that. Even if you're not well off, even if you don't have success or the financial stability that you wish you did, you can still start working now to better yourself, to try to look those metaphorical demons in the eye and try to um, find a, a healthy and positive way to deal with them and overcome them as much as you can. Because I, I think like my therapist has reminded me on numerous occasions, I'll probably always be the kind of person who wrestles with negative thoughts, who experiences that kind of bothersome inner critic, and who is predisposed to bouts of depression, etc. 
But with the right attitude and the right kind of tricks and techniques in your toolbox, you can do your best to kind of keep that all at bay and thusly, you know, allowing yourself to still have a good quality of life and be able to experience some measure of happiness and fulfillment. A big thing for me was uh, a long time ago, probably over 10 years ago now, a therapist recommended this book to me entitled Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And it totally sounds like some cheesy self-help book, you know, uh, based on the title alone or whatever. But it's actually written by... um, I'm trying to think what his official title is, if if he's a psychologist or psychiatrist or what. But someone in the field of cognitive therapy. You might have heard the, uh, you know, the acronym CBT, short for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And um, the idea is that there's thoughts behind our negative emotions, but they're so kind of automatic that usually we're not even aware of them. It's as if they're happening on a kind of semi or or subconscious level or whatever. And um, if you can if you can learn to kind of capture those thoughts, approach them rationally, and pinpoint what's wrong and distorted in in your thinking, and then replace that initial negative automatic thought with a more positive, rational thought, um, it, it can almost instantaneously alleviate a lot of the, uh, the negativity or the emotional angst accompanying the original thought or whatever. And uh, it, it might sound like quackery to some of you, but I mean, cognitive behavioral therapy is pretty much uh, a mainstream psychiatric tool or or school or whatever. I think the therapist I have now has a little different take on it, or he focuses more on actions than he does cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, But I've definitely found cognitive behavioral therapy to be a big help in my life. And sometimes I get lazy and I don't practice the techniques enough, you know. But one of my favorite ones and I may have mentioned this on the show once or twice before, it's called the triple column technique. You basically, you just take a piece of paper and you create three columns. And the first column is for automatic thoughts. The second column is for distorted thinking or cognitive distortions. Sorry about that. And the third column is for a rational response. And so, for instance, maybe your initial thought might be, and you might not even be aware of the actual thought at first, you might just more feel the emotion or the mood. But then when you take a closer look, you realize there's thoughts behind it. Maybe you feel like a piece of shit, you know, maybe you just feel down and depressed. And then, but if you stop and say, why do I feel down and depressed, you know, and also if maybe you realize this, there's some kind of thinking behind the emotion and uh, maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm a loser nobody likes me, I don't have any real friends or whatever, you know. So that would be your automatic thought. And then you would move to the cognitive distortion column. And there's a whole list of cognitive distortions that you learn, you know. In this case, um, one might be labeling. You're labeling yourself a loser. When no one, for the most part, is just one thing, you know. It's, it's usually not fair or accurate to just slap a single label on someone, especially a negative label, like to say this person is just this one negative thing or word or whatever. I sometimes think people try to wound or box in other people by calling them things like, you know, white trash, the N-word, loser, whatever, as, as if the person is nothing more than the embodiment of that epithet. Uh, when in fact, people are multifaceted, complicated beings. Even though we might not want to admit it, even our worst enemy probably has some redeeming qualities, you know? 
So one might be labeling, another might be all or nothing thinking, where maybe, you know, you're saying, I have no friends. When maybe, you know, maybe you have lost touch with certain friends, but on the other hand, most of us, you probably have some, even if it's someone you enjoy talking with and have a rapport with at work, uh, or maybe you do have some really good friends, you just haven't seen them a while, in a while because everyone's busy, uh, or maybe when you think about it, hey, you know, I was just talking to uh, someone yesterday who I consider a friend, you know? And, uh, yeah, so labeling, all or nothing thinking. One might be emotional reasoning. You know, you're letting your emotions get the best of you. When, in fact, if you look at the situation rationally, what you're feeling isn't the case. Like I was just saying with the all or, all or nothing distortion or error. You do actually have friends, you know? Um, and then there's others like magnification, like, you know, you're blowing the situation out of proportion. Um, and then there's uh, one of my favorites or that I find that, you know, I'm guilty of a lot is, uh, is jumping to conclusions. And there's two kind of subcategories or whatever. There's, there's uh, fortune teller's error and then there's mind reading or mind readers error or whatever. So you might say, when I go away this weekend, you know, on that ski trip or whatever the hell it is, it's going to be horrible. I, I know I'm going to feel weird and awkward. I'm not going to get along with the people there. And that would be fortune teller's error. You don't know. Maybe think about past trips. Maybe you've been pleasantly surprised and find that although you have a negative outlook at the beginning, you actually end up having a better time than you planned on. And mind reader's error might be, like, like maybe you had, like, a little tiff with a friend. Or maybe you wor you're worried that a friend's mad at you. And you might think, oh, they never want to talk to me again. They want nothing to do with me. That would be the mind reader's error. You have no idea what they're, uh, what they're thinking. You could be right to some degree. They might be pissed at you, but they also might be still considering you a friend and they don't see uh, this occasion or this tiff as something that's worth throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know, uh, of throwing a friendship away. So, I don't know. So, so I've found that kind of thing, as corny as it might sound, to be very helpful in my own life. And then the therapist I have now, it's kind of cool because... He kind of has an affinity for Eastern religion. And although I'm, you know, an atheist, agnostic atheist, I went through a period when I was younger where I really delved deeply into Eastern religion, into Buddhism, etc. And I still think that I learned a lot of valuable kind of life lessons or learned new ways to look at things from studying Eastern religion and philosophy. And there's a lot I learned from Buddhism that I still carry with me, uh, like trying to maintain a certain degree of equanimity or healthy detachment and not allowing yourself to be too controlled by the tumult of your temporary emotions or whatever, you know. And so we've talked about that in my therapy sessions. And he's talked about like, another thing is like, if you're experiencing a tough time, if you're experiencing a lot of negative thoughts and emotions, try to identify that part of yourself that's kind of the watcher, that's kind of observing all this, and allow yourself some kind of detachment and to kind of realize that these are temporary thoughts and emotions and almost kind of like clouds. I know that probably sounds cheesy as hell or whatever, you know, but you let them pass by, you know what I mean? Or you do your best to. So there's lots of different tricks and techniques you can put in your toolbox to help you deal with uh, negative thinking and negative emotions. And so I'm not saying that cognitive behavioral therapy necessarily would have kept Kate Spade or Anthony Bourdain from committing suicide, but I do think CBT techniques can be very useful for people wrestling with depression, anxiety, or negative thinking in general. And yeah, so the point I was trying to make a while back to reiterate is that wealth and success aren't some magical cure-all or antidote for your troubles. Like I said, it probably is really nice not to have to worry about money, 
But despite your level of success or your income bracket, no one's a nerd or immune to the vagaries of existence or that dark nadir that can await those of us that wrestle with depression. And yeah, um, there was another component that I want to move into. I was thinking about how I could segue. But here's, hopefully he doesn't mind me reading this uh, on the air or whatever, but my friend uh, sent me another message this morning. He said, it's weird. If there was ever someone who seemed to be enjoying life, it was him. I actually felt legit sadness when I heard about it because I liked that dude. And I replied, yeah, I loved Bourdain. It was a shock at first when I first read your message, but I think it kind of makes sense in a weird way when I really think about it. He definitely had some darkness in him, which is what I liked about him, the morbid, irreverent sense of humor, etc. And as an ex-addict, he probably had some demons. Yeah, I think that's true. Bourdain definitely was this... You know, I never met him in person, but just watch him on TV like so many other people. I just thought he was this great guy with a great attitude who really knew how to enjoy life. And yet at the same time, there was a certain darkness in his humor. And there was a certain kind of world wariness about him, you know. And it almost reminds me of, uh, you know, it's similar to the case with a lot of stand-up comedians. Often comedians, you know, like Bourdain, they're these bright, sensitive, intelligent, funny individuals, but they also have their demons, you know? And often, like a lot of my favorite comedians, there is a kind of darkness in their humor, and that darkness is coming from somewhere, you know? And for a lot of them, their sense of humor might be a coping mechanism in a way. And I'm not a I'm not a comedian. Um, I hope I'm at least borderline funny every now and then on the show. But I definitely use humor as a coping mechanism. I don't even necessarily mean by telling jokes or something like that. But I just mean in my everyday life, if I find myself getting stressed out or whatever, I try to see the uh, the absurdity in things. Oh, when stuff gets, you know, j to be just too much, kind of <laughs> have a, oh, well, fuck it, and kind of just, you know, laugh at the whole absurd enchilada. Just crank open that release valve a little, you know, <laughs> and try to have a little fun and see the humor and things or whatever. And I don't want to get too much into the lurid, sordid, tabloid side of things. Uh, I have uh, way too much respect for Bourdain for that, but but there was one thing, because uh, I did find myself, as soon as I heard about his suicide, I, I wondered if he and Asia Argento were still an item at the time, because not only am I a big fan of Anthony Bourdain, but it's kind of like a horror movie buff, I consider Asia Argento as kind of horror movie royalty. She's the daughter of Italian horror director Dario Argento and uh, also an, an, an actor in her own right and uh, just seems like an all-around cool person. Um, and I wondered if, you know, how things were going with them, if they were still together. And I was reading this article uh, that said, Argento's recent Instagram story posted around three hours before Bourdain's death was first reported uh, was a photo of herself wearing a ripped t-shirt that read, in quotes, F everyone. And then she wrote, you know who you are, says she captioned the post. So it sounds like she wasn't pleased with someone. Doesn't mean it was Bourdain. And I think within hours of his death, she had published a really kind of nice, tasteful response to his passing. Pretty much just saying, you know, what a stand-up guy he was, how he was her rock, her protector, um, all, all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't know what the story is there. I don't know if they had a fight. Maybe they didn't. I, I don't know if uh, anything that happened between them may have acted as some kind of trigger. I, I, To be honest, I have no idea, and I'm trying to be responsible by not doing too much speculating. 
And I also thought about how um, he didn't have a daughter with Argento, but I've been following Bourdain for so long that I can remember when he got married. Uh, it seems like just yesterday. It might have been during the uh, No Reservation days. That was a great show. That was the show before, you know, the, the show he was doing at the time of his, up until the time of his death, uh, Parts Unknown, was it, right, with CNN? He had met and married a woman during that period, I think, and they had a daughter. The daughter must still be really young. Uh, so, and now she's going to have to go through the rest of her life without a father, and he seems like he would have been, like, such a cool dad to have, too. A dad that you'd want there for you, you know, throughout your life or your formative years. And I think it's tempting to want to say well, how shitty and selfish for him to take his life when he had this child, this young life depending on him who needed him, you know. And I think as I understand it, you know, it's that... When someone's in the grip of a severe bout of depression, the depression can really skew or distort your perception of reality in yourself. And you can convince yourself that you're absolutely worthless, that, you know, it's all right to take your life because the people in your life don't really need you anyway. You know, uh, I'm sure Bourdain, he seems like he was a really sensitive and caring guy. I'm sure he must have loved his daughter. Which tells me he must have been in a really dark and horrible place to resort to taking his own life. And yeah, I just looked it up. Uh, his daughter was born in 2007. I can't believe it was that long ago. Still really young, so she's only like 11 years old. And I know from personal experience, uh, what was it, like a year or so ago? Uh, yeah, it was probably the, the winter before last. It was like all of a sudden... My antidepressants stop, stopped working. And I was originally prescribed antidepressants for these chronic migraine headaches. And for some reason, they're the only thing that keeps those headaches at bay. So it's most likely some kind of serotonin thing. Um, no one knows exactly for sure you know, what exactly causes migraines. But one theory is that it has something to do with low serotonin levels. And serotonin is also the neurotransmitter. That's like a feel-good chemical. And it's uh, the chemical that's boosted by a, a lot of uh, antidepressants such as SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And I'm on uh, a member of that class of drug. I'm on fluoxetine, which is generic Prozac. And I kind of came clean with myself when I started taking antidepressants for headaches and admitted to myself that I probably had some other things going on too, that, you know, there was some depression, anxiety there. And in fact, there often is a comorbidity between um, migraines and depression. And like, yeah, so like over a year ago during the winter, all of a sudden it was like, the antidepressant just stopped working and my headaches came back with a vengeance and my mood just plummeted. I felt so dark, like in such a dark and despairing place. And it was hard for me to imagine that life would ever get good again. It's just, you cannot picture it. It just seems that Things are so bad that you, you're unable to reason how they could be good again. Um, and I tried to go as long as I could trying different remedies and, you know, this and that. Even bought one of those, uh, those indoor lights that are supposed to help produce uh, or elevate serotonin. Uh, one of those mood lights. And nothing was working. So eventually I gave in. And I let the doctors do what they wanted to do, which is um, raise my dose of Prozac. First, they raised it 10 milligrams from 20 to 30 milligrams. Then I, I started to feel better, but the headaches were still kind of hanging on. So they raised it to 40, which is where I'm at now. And it's like the, the headaches are non-existent now. My mood's better and the headaches are completely at bay again. Um. 
And it, it does kind of suck knowing that you have to rely on a medicine. But if it makes you feel good and helps you function, I mean, what are you going to do? It's better than not taking it, right? Um, maybe sometime down the road at some point, I'll see how I can fare without it again. You know, um, try to event, uh, eventually try to get off of it. Who knows? Maybe medical technology will improve. They'll either, either have other therapies or other, you know, treatments or uh, a better class of drugs. I have to say, Prozac ain't a bad drug. Um, of all the different antidepressants I've ever tried, it makes me feel, it leaves me feeling the most natural. Like I don't feel like I'm on a drug. It gives me a very natural kind of like even keeled feeling. Um, my only complaint would be maybe to some degree it can kind of dampen your libido a little, you know. But I think you can kind of adjust to that over time. And it can end up not really being a big deal, at least not a big enough deal to discontinue the med the medication. And I've always been someone that was kind of naturally libidinous anyway, so it's it, it's far from like chemical castration. My uh, my my libido is still there. It just might not be as through the roof as as it would be without an antidepressant. And they're not exactly sure why that is, but they think it has something to do with serotonin. You know, there's a a delicate balance of neurotransmitters involved in things like libido, etc. And it could be that when you're already feeling good or content, when your brain's kind of flooded, for lack of a better word, with those feel-good chemicals, maybe you don't feel as hungry for sex or whatever because you're already feeling satisfied to some degree. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's known that different antidepressants can have varying degrees of sexual side effects. I find the two antidepressants that I've personally tried that had the least sexual side effects were probably venlafaxine, brand name Effexor, and Prozac. And you might think that sound, that's funny with Prozac because it's such an old school drug, but for me at least, it seems to be the case. And I've tried other drugs that are supposed to you know, be touted as having less sexual side effects, like uh, Wellbutrin and Paxil. And they basically crippled my sex drive and sexual performance. Um, I don't know what... I have some weird kind of brain chemistry with the drugs that are supposed to have the least impact on that area of your life have the most for me. And the older school drugs that you would think might be more troublesome in that area don't bother me as much. Who the, who the hell knows? But to be crude at this point, you know, I, I still notice women and... Uh, I, I can still stand at attention, so so why get off the Prozac now, you know? So I've been rambling for a while now, and this has been probably obviously completely unscripted. And in closing, it might sound kind of cold, you know, there's just so many celebrity deaths that occur, and once in a while, a celebrity who I really admire and have a genuine affection for will die, and it will hit me pretty hard. But once someone's gone, they're gone. And there's nothing you can do to get them back. So all you can do is, you know, shake your head and say, what a waste, you know. Um, and I think of any celebrity death that's occurred in a while, this one has probably hit me the hardest. I just, you know, really loved Anthony Bourdain. He was, seemed like such a great guy, just loved his attitude towards life. Like a lot of other people, I loved uh, kind of living vicariously through him, watching him travel the world on TV and uh, seeing all the different foods and all the different cultures, etc. that he got to, you know, partake in. And, and there is something that I think adds to the morbidity of the loss that he took his own life. You know, because even though I kind of rationalize how in a weird way it makes sense, you know, I, I think there probably was this kind of darkness within him and he was a former addict. And so he probably did have his, you know, figurative demons that he, he battled. And I think I remember watching episodes of No Reservations or Parts Unknown where he would openly talk about 
the medicines he would take he was taking like painkillers or whatever to sleep or get through the day or whatever so i i don't know how much he might have been wrestling with uh even you know prescription substances or whatever but yeah so even though in retrospect putting the puzzle pieces together i could kind of see you know I, I could kind of see how he did have that kind of darkness in him that might lead him to do something like this, despite how full of life and how humorous uh, and adventurous he was, you know. Um, but still, just still knowing that he took his own life, it, it does, it, it makes his passing seem darker somehow. I'm trying to think of other celebrity deaths that hit me pretty hard. Um it's funny, I wasn't a huge Heath Ledger fan, but I think both Heath Ledger and Brittany Murphy, and I don't say I wasn't a huge fan of Heath Ledger because I don't think he was talented. It's just because I wasn't that familiar with his work. But I, like a lot of people, I did think he was amazing in, uh, was it The Dark Knight, where uh, he portrayed the Joker. I, I loved his interpretation of that character and how much... He just kind of threw himself into the role and, and the intensity of the performance he gave. I don't know, what was the title of that movie? Was, the, was it The Dark Knight or The Dark Knight Returns? I, I forget. I apologize. But either way, um, when he and, and Brittany Murphy died, I think just because they were so young, they're like these young, attractive talented people with their whole lives ahead of them not like whether or not you're attractive should <laughs> you know factor into how much worth you have as a human being or how much your death should be seen as a, a net loss or not but you know what i mean you just look at this person had all this these different things going for them and uh you just think such a waste man they had so much life a ahead of them and you guys know what a Doors freak I am. And I remember when, you know, a few years back, whenever it was now, when Ray Manzarek, the, the uh, keyboardist for the Doors, passed away. That kind of hit me hard, but uh, he wasn't a spring chicken, and he was sick, and I knew it had to come sometime. So it was still sad, and I still felt the loss, but it seemed... Uh, part of the natural cycle, so to speak, you know? But I, I don't know what else to say about all this, so... Uh, I remember when Ray Manzarek died, I said something along the lines of, you know, uh, I don't really believe in afterlife, but if there is one, you know, I hope he's in a really good place in it uh, and having a good time or whatever. Um, and I don't even know if that's worth saying. Because, you know, I, I'm an agnostic atheist, but I'm still atheistic enough that I strongly doubt the existence of an afterlife or that the uh, the personal self survives the, the, the death of the body or the death of the brain. Uh, and Bourdain seems so world-weary in a way. I'm like, maybe the best reward is the perfect rest of oblivion, you know? <laughs> but... I guess, yeah, if there is an afterlife on some off chance, if there is one, I, I hope he's having the, the best pot. I, I hope he is enjoying the best possible status <laughs> in, in that uh, hypothetical realm. But all right, guys, definitely a loss. And uh, maybe I'll watch some old episodes of um, No Reservations in honor of Bourdain. I was going to say, one of my favorite episodes is, is one of the Christmas specials, but it had uh, Mario Batali on it. And I'm sure I'll probably look at that differently now in light of the scandal he's been embroiled in. Uh, but all right. Th thanks for uh, listening, guys. And until next time. Don't you forget about dying. Don't you forget about your friend death. Don't you forget that you will die.